Well, it's 7.02, so we'll get started now. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Welcome to the resumption of our webinars, the Swingle Clinic webinars. This webinar is presented by Dr. Paul Swingle. Many of you know him. Uh, for those that do not, let me just read a bit of his uh, bio. Paul G. Swingle is a PhD FCPA Fellow of the Canadian Psychological Association, Registered Psychologist, Senior Fellow BCIA, BCN, BCB. Dr. Swingle can be considered one of the founding fathers of clinical psychoneurophysiology, one of a select few directly responsible for bringing neurotherapy out of university labs and clinics to the general populace in the 1980s. His academic positions include Professor of Psychology at the University of Ottawa from 1972 to 97, Lecturer in Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School from 91 to 98, Associate Attending Psychologist at McLean Hospital in Boston, Head of the Clinical Psychophysiology Service, McLean Hospital in Boston. Professor Swingle was also Clinical Supervisor at the University of Ottawa from 1987 to 1997 and Chairman of the Faculty of Child Psychology from 1972 to 1977. Dr. Swingle is a registered psychologist in British Columbia and is board certified in biofeedback and neurotherapy. He is actively involved in research and practice. His numerous publications, including nine books and numerous peer-reviewed journal publications, some of which can be accessed on our website at swingleclinic.com. Today's topic is the treatment of severe anxiety disorders. And with that, I will pass it over to Dr. Paul Swingle. Dr. Swingle, it's all yours. Okay. Hi, folks. Uh, <laughs> this topic uh, turns out to be pretty relevant to what we're all experiencing here. Anxiety is a very interesting concept. Uh, as it's indicated in this little note here, uh, the state of what we experience as anxiety or angst uh, shares a lot of physiological similarities with other conditions such as joy, ecstasy, thrill, happiness, and delight. But the emotional aspect of it is obviously quite different. And a metaphor that, uh, not a metaphor, but a, a um, condition I'd like you to consider as we're reviewing some of this is, uh, I treat a lot of uh, athletes. And some of them are uh, Olympic level. And some of them are just young kids. And, uh, and the ones that come to mind are little girls who uh, are really into figure skating, ice skating. And, and one of the conditions that they're concerned about is, of course, their performance. And one of the things that we try to do with them, above and beyond what I'm going to be talking about, physiologically improving their stress tolerance, there's also an emotional cognitive side to this. And this is where mindfulness and all those other kind of techniques have relevance. If this little child, when she's doing her warm-ups, is thinking about, am I going to get through this next three minutes, her performance, without making a fool of myself or falling, that's very different from her thinking, I've been doing and practicing this for a long time, this is going to be the most, the three most glorious moments of my life. It's the same arousal, just a different way of looking at it and a different way of experiencing it. So those are the kinds of things that we're going to be sharing as we're moving along here. Okay. Now, the first thing is we're going to be looking at brain activity. And what I want to show you is what's called the alpha response. And this is the brain 
wave associated with just closing your eyes. When you close your eyes, the and, uh, visual properties associated with the brain go offline, obviously. And the brain has a particular configuration that reflects that, and this is it. And you'll see, there we go. Now this, on the bottom side, the green side, are very slow frequencies, you know, down around one, two, three cycles a second. And the upper side are the faster frequencies, up around 25 or so on this scale. And you'll notice that there's an inverse relationship between uh, amplitude and frequency. The lower frequencies have the higher amplitudes. And here's an eyes closed situation. You see, she just closed her eyes and you get a nice jump in those blue areas. That's the alpha. And when she opens her eyes where she just did, it drops like a stone. Okay. So the brain is reflecting a lot of these kinds of conditions and we can understand what a normal reaction looks like. So this is a, just a general alpha response measured in the back part of the brain when an individual opens and closes and then opens their eyes again. And you could see when she closed her eyes, you got a nice jump in the alpha frequencies. Those were the blue ones. And when she opened her eyes, they dropped like a stone. Now, this is what happens if a person has been exposed to traumatic level emotional trauma. Now, the first thing that you notice is that the curve looks flatter than the other one. And when she closes her eyes, you're going to see that it doesn't look quite the same. And there's a blunting of the alpha response. And the alpha, the blue areas there. Okay, you can see it bounces up a little bit, but nowhere near as strong as the other one. And this is just eyes closed, eyes open. That's all we're measuring here. Okay, so you can see the impact of exposure to emotionally, uh, very traumatic levels of emotional exposure have a direct impact on the brain. And we call this the trauma marker. Now, I'll show you later, but if an individual shows that marker, there are several things I know. First of all, their creativity is in the pits because blunted alpha reflects itself in lost creativity. The second thing usually is short-term memory is affected because this is a waveform that is associated with transfer of information into the short-term memory registers, okay? But most importantly, it's telling me that the person sitting in front of me for treatment has a very significant emotional component to their condition. And they have to be prepared for the fact that the emotions are going to start to release as part of treatment. Ideally, it should happen in sleep, but it may happen in waking hours. And it's um, a, uh, a treatment uh, milestone when that happens. Very, very, very beneficial. Okay. Now, some of the conditions that we treat are things like epilepsy and other seizure disorders. And one of the things that we found is that we have a condition called pseudo seizure disorder in which there are no neurological reasons, conditions associated with the seizure. It's all emotional. And this is a client who had pseudo seizure disorder at, that was directly responding to the level of autonomic arousal, that is, the arousal of the autonomic nervous system. And as we provoked greater levels of arousal, this is skin conductance level, which is a measure of body arousal. 
when the arousal of both hands went above six micromoles, it provoked a seizure. Okay. Now, whenever we're dealing with something of this nature, the pseudo seizure is designed, or the function of it, uh, is to block feeling the emotions associated with the trauma. Okay. Very interesting. Now, when we're talk talking about how a person responds to uh, emotional, uh, severe emotional stress, we have the issue of neurological predispositions, and we'll be talking about that at length. People have predispositions for all kinds of things, but you need something to turn the key for that to manifest. For example, a person might have a predisposition to depression, but if nothing turns the key, they're happy as a clam. The stress resilience, that's a purely physiological situation. Does the brain produce enough of a certain frequency to help the body process and deal with stressful circumstances efficiently? Emotional dysregulation, that's the predisposition. Those are the predispositions I was talking about before. And another condition that we'll talk about at length here a little later is a tendency for the brain to get fixated on something like obsessive compulsive disorder. So if you have something that you're really anxious about and that every year the brain is hyperactive, then you can't get it out of your mind. Okay. So we have a lot of ways to neurologically attack this problem if somebody is being in some way uh, having uh, difficulties associated with stress. Okay, now, the first thing that we're going to be looking at is some of the conditions associated with the frontal part of the brain. Now, the frontal, frontal part of the brain is associated with executive functioning, of course, all the intellectual things that have to get processed, but it's also the major player in mood modulation, and the degree of compatibility between the two front parts of the brain and various waveforms tells us a lot about what are the predispositions to depression, anxiety, hostility, and so forth and so on. Okay. The other area when we're talking about stress, the biggie is the occipital region in the brain, the back of the brain. And that's the area that's associated with stress tolerance, sleep quality, the ability to process and quiet, okay? Now, it's important to keep in mind that uh, one of the things when we're working with high-functioning people, CEOs and uh, Olympic-level athletes and so forth, is hey, you don't want to suppress all of this emotional arousal. What you want to do is utilize it, okay? So we have an idea of what the brain should look like in terms of good stress tolerance. And we want to see that when we're doing optimal performance, of course, and when we have people come in with stress issues, sleep issues, and so forth. Now, the other area of the brain that's particularly important is sitting right in here, the anterior cingulate gyrus. It's sitting right in the frontal part of the brain on the midline. That's the area of the brain associated with perceptive thought. You get something on your mind, you just can't get it out. Now, that can be a major contributor to anxiety. It's always, always present in panic disorder. The, story, the person starts to get anxious, the brain gets it and, and then uh, just spirals it right out of control. And it's also a major sleep disturber. You know, these are the folks, you know, you hop in bed, you're ready to go to sleep, close your eyes, and the brain figures, hey, this is a very good time to go over my shopping list endlessly over and over and over and over again. And it can be the stupidest things. I mean, I've had situations in which wondering whether I had enough paper clips on my desk, you know, that kind of nonsense. So, but it's a double-edged sword. You know, if junk gets caught in there, it's a problem, you know? And, uh, predisposition to 
depression, anxiety. But if you don't have any junk in there and you keep that on the hot side for an athlete, they get fixated on jumping hurdles. And that's the difference between the audience and the podium. Okay. So everything you want to look at is a double edged sword. Okay. At the first impact of stress is sleep. Now, we do sleep assessments on our folks and um, there are units that you take home and we measure it for a full week. It's so much more accurate than the sleep labs. And what this is showing us is what a night's sleep looks like for this person, okay? Now, the two components of sleep that are absolutely critical are REM, rapid eye movement sleep. That's when the brain is doing its own psychotherapy and process and filing of information. And deep sleep, that's when the body is doing all the toxic transfers and all the other things it has to do. Now, what you need is roughly an hour of deep and roughly two hours of REM. And you can see that this person is deficient in deep sleep, getting 22 minutes, about half of what is needed. And REM, sitting at 27, you know, getting about a quarter of what's required. This is a uh, client in which we have deficient deep sleep. Now you can see the total amount of sleep is eight hours, um, but the critical thing is the sleep architecture. It's not the amount of time you're laying in bed or asleep that's critical. What is critical is how much deep sleep you're getting and how much REM. So here's a person that has adequate REM but deficient deep sleep. And a saying in my business is if you fix sleep, you fix everything. And sleep is so, so critical to our well being. Okay. Now, here's an individual who, and, you know, the, the, the deep sleep is, is close to what he needs, uh, but the REM is very deficient. He only gets 50% uh, of what's required here. Okay, the one thing you want to keep in mind is that more is not necessarily good in terms of sleep. Now, you know, eight hours of sleep is okay. I'm a six hour guy. If I get one hour of REM, I'm sorry, one hour of deep and two hours of REM, everything else is icing on the cake as far as I'm concerned. So, you know, there are an awful lot of folks that function very, very efficiently on six hours of sleep. The problem with excessive sleep is it's generating a waveform that gives rise to fatigue. So that the more you sleep, the more tired you get. And somebody my age, excessive sleep is a real risk factor. I'm pushing 83 years of age, and I want to be very careful about excessive sleep. You know, this is what happens in older folks. They uh, go to bed early, they sleep about 10 hours, they get up, and the only thing they're thinking about is when they're gonna have their next nap, okay? And that's what you have to be concerned about. So too much sleep ain't a good thing. Your sleep architecture is the big issue here. Now, the other thing about anxiety is it's very often misdiagnosed as this depression. And people get any uh, depressive medication, it doesn't work, so they jack it up and jack it up so that you're, you know, you're, uh, what they're doing is sedating it, they're not treating it. And a lot of folks have this kind of dilemma in which the medication cocktails they're getting the side effects are far more problematic than the, the, the disorder itself, okay? And that's why it's so critical to have a look at what the brain is doing when we have these conditions, okay? What is it that we're dealing with? Okay. Now, this is anxiety-based depression, and I'm showing you some raw data here. 
This is a 50 year old man, a long depression history, long medication psychotherapy history, not effective, obviously, otherwise he would not be sitting in front of me. Okay. Now, the first thing that we see, CZ or CZ is sitting right on top of the head, right in the middle, right on top of the head. Now, remember that alpha response I showed you earlier? Well, his alpha response is only 18%. We want it above 30. So I know that this fellow is dealing with some trauma. Okay. When we look at O1, which is the back part of the brain, again, you can see a major deficiency in the alpha response. And if you look at the theta-beta ratio, eyes open, that's the ratio of very slow frequency versus very fast frequency. He's sitting at 0.66. We want it around two. So the brain is always going churning, 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 okay? And that's true eyes open and eyes closed. Now, if we look at the front part of the brain, we can see that the right side of the front part of the brain that I was talking about earlier is markedly more active than the left. And that's your marker for the genetic predisposition to depressed mood states, okay? So we have a situation in which the individual has a marker for predisposition to depressed mood states, and major problems with processing of uh, anxiety, okay? And if you look at FZ, you can see that and the uh, amount of activity of that uh, area that we were talking about, the anterior cingulate gyrus, is just on fire. So he gets anxious, he can't let it go, it gets caught in the brain, it gets markedly exacerbated, he's fatigued, he doesn't sleep, he's, the brain is not processing all of this stuff, he's a mess, okay? Now, you can medicate this till the cows come home, which apparently they did, to no effect, okay? You have to go to the cause. What is it in the brain that's associated with the condition that you're dealing with. And you have to have somebody who knows what they're doing when they're looking at it. There are no one size fits all situations here at all. Anybody doing that and proposing that to you clearly doesn't know what they're doing, period. Okay, so what we were looking at in the, uh, the last few slides was a problem in the back of the brain, that's your sleep and stress tolerance. No, you didn't have enough slow frequency activity back there relative to the fast. The second thing is <clears throat> we were dealing with uh, hyperactivity of the anterior cingulate gyrus, elevated activity of the uh, right side of the brain relative to the left. Okay? So we had all of the conditions associated with what's causing the problem with this individual, which is primarily anxiety and disturbed sleep. Now, did we any depressants help? This guy was on him for, what did I say, 30 years or 40 years? 30 year history, okay? No, wrong way to go. And it's unfortunate, it takes 30 years to figure that out. Now, I uh, wondered if anybody had any uh, questions that uh, would like address before we uh, proceed here. Any questions for Dr. Swingle? Feel free to unmute your mics or talk in the chat, and I'll take a look. Ready to go? Let's just see here. Oh, here we go. We've got one from Michelle. Uh, can genetic predispositions to anything be corrected? 
Absolutely. The fact that it's genetic doesn't mean it's in concrete. The brain is very plastic, and there are a lot of things we can do, even if they're genetic in nature. And we'll be talking about a lot of that. Yeah, that's very relevant to what we're talking about. Okay, I think we're ready to proceed. Okay. okay. Now, the brain, the, the fundamental issue that you want to keep in mind is the brain tells us everything. As if any of you are, are actually clients of the clinic and have seen me, you know that I don't ask you why you're sitting there. I tell you why you're sitting in front of me from the brain activity. You fill out forms when you come in, but I don't read them before you're sitting in front of me. Now, what do we have here? Here's a nine-year-old kid, okay? He's brought in by his mother because the teacher and counselor said that he has attention deficit disorder. That label gets flung around so much, it really, really is an annoying. Now, the theta, there are a number of uh, forms of ADD. And he's got a mild version of it. If you look at the uh, ratio of theta to beta, that's that 247 that you're looking at on your screen there. We want that below about 22, okay? And what that is, that's a, a form of uh, attention issue where the brain's putting out a little too much slow frequency. It's virtually a normal range when he's under task. It's 232 instead of 22. Okay, so he's got a minor issue. Now, <clears throat> that happens a lot. And what's triggering this is the bullying that's triggering all of the concerns this child has. Now, how do I know that? His alpha response, remember what we talked about earlier, should be up around 30%. It's sitting at 18. Now, I don't have a lot of data for this, but when the uh, trauma marker is at location CZ on top of the head, it tends to be more contemporary going on now or in the recent past. When it's at the back, 01, it tends to be more historical. Now, from a neurological perspective of treatment, it doesn't matter whether it's historical or, you know, 20 centuries ago, you know, we fix it no matter what. But it's just interesting in terms of uh, when you're assessing these things. And his stress tolerance, a little on the uh, low side, but not a big deal, okay? So we have a trauma marker here. And what we have uh, is a marker for major social uh, angst. That's that alpha that you're looking at there, minus 45. That's the front part of the brain in which the left side of the brain has considerably more alpha activity than the left. And we find that that's related, directly related to social issues, social angst, social anxiety, panic disorder, social panic disorder, and so forth. Okay, now he's also showing a major marker for emotional reactivity. That's at 67%. So he's a sitting duck for a bully. You know, this is the kind of kid you go over and go, nah, 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 and he starts crying, you know. So and that's what the brain is telling me. This kid's ADD is not the issue. This kid's emotional climate in the classroom is what the problem is and the parents had no idea this they went to the school and they sorted it out and in fact it turns out to be exactly that it was bullying that was causing the trouble now did he have a minor predisposition for it yes okay but this is what the brain is telling me, you know, it's telling me all of these things about what's going on with this child. Now, you just got, don't come in with a medication, try to slap down, you know, something in terms of stimulants. 
what you have to do here is have a look at what's going on in terms of the emotional climate of what's going on. Now, as many of you undoubtedly have thought of, is what about family? Okay. Family is a big, 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 big issue in terms of, you know, how the child is uh, able to function, secure networks and so forth and so on. You know, and we pay attention to that as well as the neurology of what we're dealing with. Okay, those are the two areas we were just talking about. <clears throat> now we can do maps that map out the whole brain. We do a fair number of these, but we typically only do the full maps when we're dealing with head injury, you know, a concussion, traumatic brain injury, uh, Parkinson's, that sort of thing. But you can see here in this particular person, they have a lot of much too uh, much fast frac, uh, fast activity in the back of the brain, and that's giving rise to a sleep disorder. You know, so uh, it's all data driven. Everything we're doing is data driven. So this is a sleep disordered guy, and there's what the problem is, and that's what you have to put to bed to improve his sleep. Okay. The other thing I just wanted to mention is, you know, we always think of uh, our uh, uh, fall, uh, uh, winter, you know, rain and darkness here in Vancouver as being primarily responsible for our seasonal affective disorder, you know. Uh, but one of the things you want to keep in mind is that uh, bipolar uh, folks very often get very, very agitated in springtime as the amount of arousal and stimulus, you know, light and so forth starts to increase. So uh, uh, when we talk about the uh, seasonal uh, affective issues, we're not only talking about the gray rain of fall, but we can be talking about the increased stimulation associated with springtime. <clears throat> okay, so what we were looking at is, uh, you know, when you have uh, too much beta, on the left side of the front part of the brain, that's a predisposition for depression. Uh, when you have too much alpha floating around the front part of the brain, you have problems with mood modulation. When you have a deficiency of slow frequency or excess of fast frequency in the back of the brain, you have sleep problems. Uh, when you're looking at uh, uh, social anxiety, uh, you can look at the amount of alpha in the front part of the brain, uh, too much uh, beta uh, on the left side in the front part of the brain is an anxiety marker. Okay, so, you know, uh, there are an awful lot of things the brain tells us, and it's very, very data-driven. Okay. Okay, so when we uh, are looking at an individual that's coming in, obviously uh, in emotional angst, anxiety-wise, we're looking for trauma markers, which we talked about. We're looking for the deficiency in the theta-beta ratio in the back of the brain, which we uh, talked about. We're looking for the depression markers, which we talked about. That's uh, when the right side of the brain is more active than the left. Um, frontal vigilance markers, you often find this with people with trauma. Uh, who have been traumatized, particularly as children, that the uh, front part of the brain is showing a marker of uh, inability to just come offline. You know, these are the people who are always looking over their shoulder. Uh, the anxiety marker we talked about, that's when the left side of the brain has excessive fast frequency. High frontal alpha amplitude in the front part of the brain, we talked about that, that's emotional uh, fluctuation and problems with planning and organizing and so forth. Okay, and the point here is that the brain tells us all of this. And, you know, as this stuff starts to stack up, the, the person becomes more, more uh, distressed. And the way to handle this is not to simply subdue it with uh, some kind of medication. The, the issue is normalized brain functioning. Placebos. <clears throat> I love this. You know, people always say, well, what you're doing is all placebo. I say, well, I certainly hope so. 
you know, for goodness sake. One of the, you know, the data are quite clear here. Uh, if uh, you're able to marshal a person's expectation about the efficacy of what you're doing, you're going to increase its e efficacy by about a third. So, yeah, yeah. What we do works. It really, really works. And if you engage your mindset on that, then you're going to save a lot of money. Uh, you have to come in far less, uh, far fewer times, and your uh, the uh, impact is going to be uh, better. Yeah, and that's placebo. Let's just call it what it is: expectation that I'm going to get better. Okay. <clears throat> now, th this is something that really I find distressing, and that is. Uh, the data that are coming out on supplements, you take a supplement if you need it. You don't take a supplement if you don't need it. But that's the bottom line here. And here in uh, this area of the world, you know, we need a vitamin D supplement. So we take a thousand a day, you know, that kind of thing. But if we're taking these other supplements that are supplementing <clears throat> areas where we're not deficient, there's some evidence to indicate that that can be problematic and can be a, a, you know, it can give rise to problems. Okay, so that silver bullet bullet syndrome, we really have to put to bed. I love this. What this is is the data associated with both physiological measures of stress and self-reported stress just by taking a few minutes to go into the gallery and look at some art, okay? It makes a difference. It really makes a difference. There's so many things that you can do to help modulate, you know, your own stress. Now, all of your traditions, the Saxang traditions, are associated with meditation. And the purpose of meditation from my perspective as a neuro neurophysiologist is to stop you from thinking because most of your thoughts are negative. And what they do is, and there are lots of different methods for meditating. The whole purpose of that is to get you to stop thinking and have your focus on a more ecclesiastical context. You know, this is the divine focus of your meditation, but you can meditate on anything. You can meditate on, uh, uh, you know, a burning candle, okay? So keep that in mind as we're moving through here. Going and watching and looking at art and appreciating something is blocking your thought process because we're very negative to ourselves. You know, the dialogue we have with ourselves, according to the, the literature anyway, is about 50% negative. And I joke with my clients, I want you to put a little note on your mirror when you get up in the morning, you know, to brush your hair or whatever. And the, the note is, you leave you alone. Okay. And it just goes without saying that uh, you have to take care of yourself with gut anxiety. You need scheduled bedtimes. You need to get your lazy duff out of bed and exercise. You should eat properly and so forth. I mean, that's just obvious on the face of it. That's what you can do to increase the baselines of what you're dealing with. And the wisdom of my favorite camel driver comes from the uh, Kilos, uh, the alchemist, is basically that if you're able to focus your attention on the now, and that's what, you know, all the mindfulness and all of these other things are focused on, is the ability to channel your focus to be in the moment. 
So there are a lot of ways that this can happen. You know, there's meditation, there's mindfulness in the moment and so forth and so on. And it's not, you know, we're not looking for the optimal method. We're looking at the method that works for you and making sure that your brain is functioning in a manner that is optimal. Now, this is not only for your well-being and anxiety uh, uh, issues, but also in terms of your health. We have some compelling evidence to indicate that all other treatments, like chemotherapy, are improved when we make the brain more efficient. Okay. Okay. Break number two. Anybody have something they want to talk about? Any questions for Dr. Swingle? Uh, I see there's one from Rossio, but uh, if anybody else has anything, feel free to speak up or post it in the chat. Uh, the question was, could you give an example of supplements which could be harmful? Yes. Anything that you're not deficient in. The, the, the two that uh, are uh, used, can be used very efficiently without any risk factor is vitamin D up to 1,000 and vitamin C that you're using, you know, in terms of the uh, alkalinity of your, uh, of your blood. And as far as the data have indicated, you know, there are no risk factors associated with the D at a thousand. Now, sometimes they want to treat you with D up and around six thousand uh, because of some deficiencies. That's okay, but when you know, once you get your baseline's okay, a thousand a day in our environment seems to uh, uh, be the one associated with uh, with uh, benefit, not risk. And the same is true of vitamin C. Now. Things like potassium and magnesium, uh, they, you know, when your physician does the blood tests on it and shows that your electrolytes are messing up your potassium and magnesium, you may want to take that as a supplement to bring your baselines up. But if your baselines are okay and you take more of that, then the data are indicating that's not a good idea. Okay. And you go on the net, you can check all of that stuff out. Uh, and and the, the one thing that I think is very apparent is that 95% at least of all of the promos for the supplements that you take are nonsense. And, you know, as a very dear friend of mine, uh, and, and the guy who uh, is the pillar of what we do, Barry Sturman said one thing, show me the data. Okay, you make a claim about a supplement, show me the data. Not testimonials, show me the data. Very true, very true. So uh, a couple of other questions came in. One of them is, uh -huh. how to best use the sweep harmonic? Oh, you must be a client of the Twinkle Clinic. <laughs> Uh, the sweep, the sweep, and the serene sweep. Uh, sweep is a uh, a uh, stimulant, and we use that for guys my age. As I said, I'm pushing 83 here, and I use sweep just to to uh, increase the stimulant uh, stimulation in the front part of the brain and balance it. Serene sweep is using a a uh, relaxing protocol in which the waveform that's being swept back and forth quiets and a lot of people find it profoundly relaxing you can use it as much as you want but the treatment that we do with it for our clients is to use it oh say twice a day for two minutes seated eyes closed headsets and keep the volume low and by the way for anybody that uh, doesn't have a serene sweep and would like to try it, uh, get in touch with Colin when this is over and 
he can download it for you. Yeah, feel free to email. Uh, you can email the office manager that's on the screen or uh, reception at Swingle Clinic works as well. So we've got a couple more questions in, lots of uh, curious people. So we've got uh, Michelle asks, how long does one have to meditate and how often in order for it to be effective in mitigating stress? Oh, that's, that's a fascinating area. I, uh, you know, when you get to be my age, there are a lot of people who are worried about you. <laughs> and uh, a couple of people who are worried about me have uh, tried to get me to go to these, uh, what I call woo-woo sessions, right? In any event, to be serious about it. <clears throat> uh, one of the uh, satsangs, uh, with the master requires two and a half hours of meditation a day. I have something that I'm going to be showing you at the end of the screen that's 12 minutes a day, a meditation that's from 16th century out of India. I'm the world's worst, worst medic, meditator. I just can't do it. You know, I start the 12-minute one, and uh, two minutes in, I'm looking at my watch wondering when it's going to end. The bottom line is the uh, the degree of commitment you have to whatever the satsang is. And, you know, if you're highly committed to a, a religious, spiritual, divine kind of operation in which, you know, the master requires a certain thing, that's what you're doing. Now, your question speaks more to the neurology of it. How much do you need to change the neurology? Now, to change the neurology, you only need a couple of minutes. And that's what we built into a lot of our treatment protocols. You know, you buy these things on, on the web. They want you to listen to it for hours and so forth and so on. You know, no. I mean, we've done a lot of research on this. Two minutes, it will change that brain. And that's a meditative kind of state. But we tech the, you know, we've we've uh, increased the technology of to make it more efficient. Now, that's a very long-winded response to your question. I think the bottom line is what do you feel comfortable with? And there are, you know, I have a lot of very dear friends who are trying to teach me how to meditate. You know, you meditate, and you 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 look you. Uh, visualize yourself looking at yourself thinking about something uh, come on give me a break okay <clears throat> I tried that and it, it ain't for me and you have to find out what works for you that's the bottom line but I would certainly give serene sweep a, a shot you may find it remarkable in terms of what it does for you Okay, there's uh, one one question asked. Can we see the the previous image of the presentation? Can we go back one? Back one. This Is one. That that the one. And uh, this, I'll let you talk while uh, they look at that. So Carmen asks a general big question: Any correlations between ongoing long-term untreated anxiety and dementias? <laughs> There's enormous data on this. And one of the things that I think we find is that severe anxiety results in a situation in which the person's demise is not characterized by the dementia. So if you die at 55, dementia ain't going to be a problem. Now, the data are very unclear on a lot of these things. My feeling is that if you have uh, severe anxiety that is untreated, that you are at risk for a lot of things. You're at risk for disorders like cancer. You're at risk for inefficiency of treatments Okay, because they don't work efficiently in the brain, uh, you know, in this hyper-aroused brain, okay? 
So and the first thing that we do when somebody comes in, no matter what the problem is, is stress tolerance is number one, which affects sleep. Then we go after what are the other imbalances that we're dealing with. If the person's working with another provider, you know, we share all of the stuff. Un unfortunately, very often the other provider thinks that what we do is all hocus pocus nonsense. You know, that's not very helpful. So, hope I answered your question there. All right, I think that's it for all the questions. Uh, I can talk a bit about the announcements now if you like, Dr. Swingle, or would you like to move on? Oh, no, go right ahead. Okay, so here at the clinic, uh, just want to touch on some of the things we're doing these difficult times since our, our operations are closed right now for in-person contact, as you may have noticed. So we're, we're doing some things like these webinars. So these are public, they're free. We just want to reach out and connect with people. So we're, we're doing that on a weekly basis every Wednesday right now. Uh, we're also doing some group sessions. So if, if that's something you're interested in, uh, we've got that going on twice a week right now. Uh, we're also reaching out to people and, and offering some consultations here and there. So uh, that's an option too. If you're interested in anything the clinic offers, feel free to, to give us a call. Our phones are still operating. Uh, we've got our email there, office manager or the reception at swingleclinic.com. And we're just looking to, to keep people connected and, and even though you're isolated, we just want everybody to, to know that we're still here, <laughs> we're with you, and uh, just act as kind of a support. Thank you. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> now, uh, I like this. Uh, this is the uh, the use of sertraline uh, cognitive behavior therapy for the treatment of uh, anxiety in kids, okay? So you can see that uh, in terms of the positive response uh, at the 12-week marker, combining cognitive behavior therapy with sertraline, the, uh, the medication, the combined effect is considerably greater than either one separately. Uh, if you look out uh, at uh, 26 to 36 weeks, then the cognitive behavior therapy and the sertraline alone and the combination are all about the same thing in terms of positive response uh, to these treatments in terms of reduction of anxiety. But six years out, uh, what we find is that there's a 50% relapse rate for both. Now, what that's telling us is that that's not an adequate treatment because it's not correcting the cause of the problem. Simple. Now, another thing that I think is very interesting when we're talking about these trauma issues is what is the impact of trauma? And this is some very interesting data. If there's a death of a nuclear family member, you know, the father or mother, birth to 2.9, the increased risk, increased, increased risk of psychotic episodes is 84%. And as you can see, as the child becomes more emotionally robust, it drops substantially. But when we see these huge impacts of the trauma that we've been talking about earlier, that you can find it uh, in terms of the historical data associated with that kind of impact on the neurology of the brain. Okay, so how do we treat this? Treatment's very straightforward. Here's a setup put an electrode on the head, references on the ear, try to make the uh, uh, that object, you know, move around on the screen. So when the brain's doing what we want it to do, 
the client hears a tone or sees something move on the screen. Okay. Brain driving, very different. And here we set it up so that if we're trying to reduce the strength of a particular waveform, every time it crosses threshold, we turn on lights or start the um, uh, electrical stimulation or sound stimulation or EMF stimulation, and we give the client uh, controllers so that they adjust the sound to and the, the lights and so forth to where they find it tolerable. Now, the reason for that is panic. Uh, if we're treating a person that's prone to panic disorder and we all of a sudden turn on these uh, strong stimulants, we're likely to provoke a, a uh, panic response. But if the person has control of it, no problem. Okay, so here we're driving up alpha, which is in the back of the brain as a precursor to trying to improve sleeping. And here what we're doing is we're stimulating electrically an acupuncture point and we're also turning on a light that flashes at 10 cycles a second which is alpha frequency. Okay so when it drops below threshold we push it by stimulating this acupuncture point. When it crosses threshold on the other side we turn on the lights to try to uh, grab it and and hold it there. And here's the kind of increases we get. In the alpha response itself, we get a response of almost 150% increase in that waveform. And if you look at uh, what happens uh, uh, after uh, the treatment, this person is in normal range. She was a client with a sleep problem. So it's extremely efficient and very, very, uh, uh, let's see here. Okay, uh, this is a, a fellow who, uh, dem who uh, threatened some demonstrators with an unloaded gun. Uh, he was a, a Vietnam veteran. Uh, and the, the alpha response was severely blunted. And this is the trauma response. And in three sessions, we got it up into normal range. Now, that trivializes what we've done. That's what we did neurologically, but you can imagine the emotional outpouring that took place when we released that with this man who had gone through that horror. Now, safe rooms. Uh, Mary Jo Sabo, who ran a lot of the uh, problematic uh, at the School for Problematic Kids in uh, Yonkers, New York, uh, developed this and uh, let me know about it. What she did was she used the R harmonics and created a little space that kids could go th to if they felt they were out of control uh, and just sit down and listen to R harmonics. And when they felt they were in control, they came back to the school, uh, to the uh, classroom. And they did that at uh, uh, tender loving care uh, place in uh, Kansas City, and they did the same thing. Uh, kid gets, you know, uppity, and uh, they go over to uh, the area or the room, and uh, the uh, amount of time in the room tends to decrease with use and the uh, reduction in number of visits. So they're learning self-control. You know, very efficient. Okay, nothing new about this. The closer you are to the person that is experiencing uh, severe problems, the more you're affected. This is the uh, caregiver problem. Okay. Now, this is, I love this. I see we're getting very close to the end here. When you release trauma, for people with artistic uh, characteristics, what you do is you release creativity. And we get the most remarkable things. This is a woman who we did a trauma release as part of her treatment. This is not a photograph. This is a painting, okay? And all she wants to do is paint. Here's another one. 
she just loved it. She bought an easel. She went out and bought a book on how to paint. Another one. This is the second painting she ever did in her life. She's a 60-year-old woman. more you know the brain just comes alive when you release the trauma and make it efficient in terms of processing that stuff <laughs> i love this I, I had this hanging in my office for any of you who are clients that have seen it uh this is a fellow is uh when i was at mclean hospital at harvard uh he walked into my he had been hospitalized for suicidality he walked into my office and he said, I'll never paint again. And I said, I'll bet you a quarter you will. And that's the quarter that he framed for me. <clears throat> and here's that short meditation. It's only 12 minutes and even I can't do it. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, I'm sure Colin can uh, send you a copy of this if you want. But it has the uh, mantra, Sata Nama. Sata nama and it has the mudra and the mudra is you know touch like telling beads and you touch your thumb and every finger you know just walk yourself through it okay and they have some data this this one has some data with it you know in terms of it can be very very useful okay folks i see we're out of time and uh uh Hopefully, we'll have another webinar before too much longer. Okay. Well, thank, thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Uh, this concludes our first webinar back, and uh, here's to the next one. Uh, thanks again. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out. There's uh, that reception at Swingle Clinic email. Uh, you can see us on Facebook as well. And uh, this will be rebroadcast on YouTube, on the Swingle Clinic YouTube channel. So take a look for that if uh, you missed anything or you want to take a look a little longer look at the slides. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming again.